in this segment is Jason Stedman. And it's just kind of, I was telling Jason that I was uh, cleaning out my desk at home the other day and I came across some papers from the Boy Scout dinner a couple of years ago. And, and Jason was actually speaking at one of those because, of course, he's heavily involved with the Boy Scouts. Jason, good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. Good morning, Rob. How are you this morning? Great, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, tell me uh, more about the Scouts and your involvement with them. Well, I'm actually the president of the Shando Area Council, mm -hmm. and we've recently merged with the Mason-Dixon Council. So we have gone from nine counties with a little over 1,200 Scouts to now 3,000 Scouts in 11 counties, going from down in Virginia all the way up to Pennsylvania. How long have you been involved with the Scouts, Jason? <sighs> I got my Eagle Scout at 13. Uh, I left and was not until I was back as an adult. I've been president of the Shenandoah Council for about five years. So we have three Eagle Scouts in the room right now. That's pretty impressive. The best I could do is Weebelows. So. <laughs> well, that's close. <laughs> Didn't quite make it all the way up, <laughs> up to that. But uh, congratulations to all three of you on that. That's pretty uh, pretty incredible. Thank, Thank you. you my, my daughter right now is a Life Scout, so she just got her life. So she should be, should be moving on pretty soon. That's excellent. Uh, good for you. Uh, why Scouting? What was so appealing to it uh, for you? It's the foremost organization for character development and leadership training that this country has. It really does produce great leaders and great citizens, and I'm really behind that. How can people get in touch with you? And I know this is not the reason why we're here to talk today, but I'm fascinated by your involvement with it. Uh, and, you know, you're the big kahuna here, too. So uh, how can people get involved with scouting? They can contact BeASCout.org or they can contact the Shenandoah Area Council. The contact information is on the web. It's SACBSA.com. Very nice. So let's get to the reason why you're here today, Jason. Well, I'm here today to announce my formal candidacy for prosecuting attorney for Berkeley County. Um, it's another passion that I have. I started my career as a prosecutor, and now that I've been practicing for 25 years, I think it's a good time for me to go back and, and give back to to Berkeley County. And you have experience in the past doing this too. I did. I was a prosecutor when I started. I actually started in high school uh, working at the prosecutor prosecuting attorney's office. I was doing a lot of uh, research for the line attorneys and things of that nature. And that was in Martin County, Florida, where I was living at the time. And then I went on to law school and was working for Bernie McCabe in Pinellas County uh, for two years as a law student and then followed up with six years as a professional attorney. Um, did that for a long time and then it was time for to have a family so i moved on and went into private practice and i've done a number of things and, and practiced in a number of different areas but i've moved back to berkeley county and have been practicing criminal law and i think i have the experience to lead the office why now as a reason to run for prosecuting attorney well as you know the incumbent is running for judge and it left a vacant seat so i figured now was the best time as any to go ahead and and make a bit. And what else makes you the right man for this job? Well, I believe in what I'm doing. Um, you hear that I'm involved in scouts. I'm also involved a lot with the recovery community, um, worked with a lot of folks. I've got probably 40 people to two plus years of sobriety. Um, I believe that that makes a big difference. And I believe that, that the county needs somebody that's focused on recovery at this point in time. We can't arrest our way out of the drug problem. We need to make sure that we can work with prevention and work with recovery to help get those out. Admiral. Yeah, uh, good morning, Jason. I have the opportunity or the pleasure of working with Jason uh, with some of the uh, litter pickup, litter cleanup with the Boy Scouts and Berkeley Community Pride. So, and Jason's been carrying the point of making this, this, this activity happen. So thanks very much, Jason. Thank you, Bill. It's an yeah. important partnership, and I think yeah. it means a lot for the future yeah. of the county as well as scouting. Yeah. You're also a public defender, are you not? Or I am not a public defender. Oh, you're not. I was thinking you were. Okay. I am basically an independent contractor. Um, I do a lot of court-appointed work uh, for the courts, and that does come through the Public Defender Services Corporation, but I am not an employee of the Public okay. Defender Service. so a contract. Uh, how much of your practice uh, is devoted, if you will, uh, to public defender type of activities? Uh, pretty much all of Everything. it. I do a lot of uh, criminal work as well as a lot of abuse <laughs> and neglect work right now. So you're in front of the, uh, the the court on a very regular basis. I think I had 12 hearings yesterday. <laughs> a regular basis, yeah. 12 is a lot. Uh, second only to Mike Height, the number of times he's in front of the court, for, but for different reasons. <laughs> yeah, and I can't talk about that. So Height, heights are all traffic incidents. <laughs> but that, that policeman's retired now, so. <laughs> Height's got a lead foot. That's what gets him in front of the traffic. <laughs> yeah. So, Jason, I, I want to take a little different route here. I'm, I'm often in politics interested in the strategy of, of individuals and in running their campaigns. And 
Um, we have a, a fairly popular prosecutor in place right now. Um, she's vacating the seat, but she's endorsing her assistant um, in the race against you. So uh, my question to you is, uh, when you have a popular uh, person in that seat now and they're endorsing someone else, how do you overcome that endorsement um, and, and her popularity in that seat currently um, to, to have a viable campaign and win? Well, I think the most important thing is to look at our experience. Now, I sat down with Joe when, when I first it, but said that I was going to run, and we agreed to keep things clean. We had a handshake, and, and we're both going to run good campaigns. But I've got 25 years' experience, and I think that's going to make the difference. I've done a lot of different types of law and practice in a lot of different areas, and I think that experience for me is what's going to make a difference. And are there any changes, if you were to win, are there any changes within that department do you think you would like to make? Yes. One of the biggest things I would like to to do is make sure that bound over cases go to the grand jury within the first term of the grand jury because right now we're paying as a county almost fifty dollars a day to keep incarcerated people in the jail if we can get them out within the first three months and get them to the grand jury in the first term then we can help ease the burden on our jails and we can save the county a lot of money like i said it's almost fifty dollars a day i think the last number i heard was forty eight dollars and thirty three cents a day and that for all individuals in the jail makes a big difference and i'm in the jail on a regular basis because i have to meet clients there and i can tell you that the corrections officers are overworked and overwhelmed and i think that would help them a lot too and do you think you can accomplish that through the prosecutor's office or is that isn't that a a, a number of um of uh, court hearings and stuff that are set for judges i mean don't don't they play into that no, that's pretty much the <clears throat> prosecutor's responsibility because the grand jury is pretty much just the prosecutor and the grand jury okay so they can have a lot of control over when cases go right now if cases get bound over they can sit for almost up to a year before they ever get presented to the grand jury now we can do more to make sure that we do get cases presented to the grand jury or work with the defense lawyers to see if we can resolve cases but not have people sit in jail for up to a year for no reason other than they have been brought to grand jury yet mike's making a very good point uh is it uh is it staffing restrictions that uh, that they have waiting up to a year before they're bound over or is it regulatory or what is it how can you make that happen uh that's not being done right now it's, it's just not being done right now the prosecutors are, are overburdened with the amount of cases that they have but i think if we make it a focus we can make sure that cases do come to grand jury uh, right now when cases are bound over there's nothing to force them to grand jury you know a lot of times they wait for a term or two before they do get brought they have to be brought before the third term so i would just make it a priority that all the cases that we can be brought to grand jury within the first term now i understand there's difficulties with that sometimes you're waiting on lab results or you're waiting for something to come back from the lab uh, i realize that but i wouldn't really make it a priority to make sure that the assistants press the cases to get to grand jury as soon as possible hey bill before you go again let me ask you about the lab jason uh, how is the backup with the lab these days <laughs> It's quite a bit backed up. Normally it's several months to get items back, especially the drugs. However, a lot of cases you can take to grand jury short of the lab. Um, you can go ahead and, and get the information that you have and present it to the grand jury and then they can make a determination as to what to charge. Is this an issue that labs all around uh, the region are having? If, if I went into Maryland or Virginia and asked them what their police uh, crime lab backup was like, would they say something similar, do you think? I, I think nation, nationwide they would say the same thing. It's a, it's a large problem. Now, West Virginia is in the process of, of building a consolidated lab. Do you think that will help um, in getting lab results back quicker? I would certainly hope so. If we can find enough people to work there, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's an issue everywhere, though. Yeah. Staffing. Yeah. yeah, going back to this, uh, this timing issue, Jason, uh, so I'm – think I'm hearing you say it's more of a scheduling problem than it is a staffing problem. There's enough uh, enough lawyers, enough staff to uh, to speed up this bound over process than what we do right now, just because of scheduling. Is that correct? I, I certainly do believe it's because of scheduling. I think if we make it a priority, we can make sure that the assistants get the cases to grand jury in the first term. Matt Harvey is one of our co-hosts. He's the Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, of course. And uh, Matt uh, will tell you that 
prosecuting attorneys aren't always the most popular people with the local police. And uh, what's your relationship like with the chief of police in uh, Martinsburg and with the sheriff of Berkeley County? Uh, I, I think my relationship with law enforcement is is fairly strong. Um, I know the sheriff fairly well. Um, worked cases with him. Um, he was actually in some abuse neglect cases that that I've had. Um, spoken to the the new chief of Martinsburg. He hasn't been chief for that long, so we don't have that long a relationship. But I do have a relationship with a lot of the officers in both departments. It's an interesting line to straddle, isn't it? With it the is. work you have to do and maintaining a relationship with the local police forces well i think my prosecutorial experience gives me some credibility with the officers mm -hmm. so they see that we can often be on the same side to make sure that justice is served when you were in florida can you think of an example where you had to walk a line uh, that was delicate in nature and you were able to find a way through it um, I can tell you an example from a friend of mine that's probably the best example that there was. Um, when we were young prosecutors, we were trying a lot of DUI cases. Pinellas County is a busy county. There's a million people in the county and 125 assistant prosecutors. That's where Tampa is, basically, right? It's St. Pete, Clearwater. Yeah. And uh, I had a friend that was trying a, a DUI case with a prominent local officer. And they went through and they had the trial and after the trial the officer kind of gave the, my friend a nudge and a wink and said it's a good thing that tape got destroyed implica <laughs> implicating that there was better evidence that would have supported the defense and my friend turned back into the courtroom and promptly null prossed the case and dismissed it uh, based on the allegation that there may have been some tampering with evidence Rob, let me ask you a question more so than uh, than Jason. Uh, you uh, implied there was an inherent conflict between the law enforcement and prosecuting attorney. Uh, I'm not aware of this inherent conflict. What is it? There can be. There isn't, I, I know, there, there isn't always. Be. They're okay, often yeah. on the same side of yeah. things, but there can be in a situation like Jason yeah. just talked about here where uh, it, it, evidence oftentimes is uh, uh, evidence and procedure. So it has to be a clean arrest. The evidence has to be handled cleanly or else you put the prosecuting attorney in a bad situation that they don't want to have to be in because now they're looking at breaking the law if the things that need to be done according to the law haven't been done to get you ready for trial. Because remember, the prosecuting attorney is the front for the case. They're the person whose face and whose name is on the line, the one you're going to read in the paper about who's prosecuting the case. And if the chain of evidence or the evidence has been handled in a way that uh, doesn't meet the standard, they're the ones who look bad at first if they have to be the ones whose face is in the newspaper, on the TV, and the case blows up because of something illegal that took place between the arrest and the trial. Uh, understand. Uh, but the prosecuting attorney is on their own volition whether or not they will prosecute a case. 100%. Hundred percent. That doesn't so, mean there's not pressure, though. But I, but I would think a prosecuting attorney felt if the evidence, uh, the evidence trail or the uh, chain of uh, chain of evidence is not adequate, or if there were some missteps on the part of the law enforcement, they just would not prosecute. But would that make them? My point is that doesn't necessarily make them popular with the police all the time. Yeah. Jason, good. I mean, you've, I'm sure you've been in a situation, or as you said, you had a friend who was in that situation before. Well, sure. And what you do in cases like that is you look at the case you have, you look at what needs to happen, and you try to get the best result. Um, sometimes that means you work a case out and you might plea it to a lesser included offense uh, where you might have a stronger legal position to argue um, or you look at what needs to be done to do the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing won't make everybody happy, but... Mm -hmm got to do the right thing all the time now th there's been recently a, a statewide reallocation of magistrates and judges in berkeley county we'll see a, additional uh, magistrates magistrates and judges will will the prosecuting attorney's office have enough staff um to handle the additional workload that um those judges and magistrates will bring they're, going, they're thin right now. Um, there, are num there are a number of people down right now. They need more individuals. I would anticipate we would need more. Um, 
going forward, if we are going to add sitting magistrates and we're going to add additional divisions, if you will, of the court, I think we're going to need to bring in additional prosecutors. But that's going to be important because, Mike, you know, as the legislature, you guys are going to have to make that decision down in Charleston. Um, I think I've got good relationships with a number of the legislatures that if we need to add some seats, I can come and talk to you about what the needs of the county are going to be. I think coming up with experience from Pinellas County, I know what it's like to be in a, a large metropolitan county. And we are growing here in Berkeley County. And I think we can handle those challenges and handle those changes, but we will need assistance from the legislature. Now, are those those positions that are in the prosecuting prosecutor's office, are they funded by the state or they're funded by the county that, in which they're in? It should be by the from the county. Mm-hmm. So are you looking for additional funding from the state level because of the, the additional judges? So what, what, would, what would you be look, seeking from a legislator? Well, I think what we'd be seeking is, is additional budget so I could hire additional assistants because that's really what would be needed. Um, that, that way they have the power and they have the manpower they need to make sure they can cover all the court calendars and still make sure they do things like make sure their cases get to the grand jury in the first term. But if, if the funding comes from the county level, what, what would state legislators be able to do? Are you, are you looking for statewide um, infusion of money to all counties for additional prosecutors? I, I think we need to look on an as-needed basis. I don't need. I don't think all counties need the same number of prosecutors. I think it needs to almost look at locality issues and look at the num amount of case law to adjust the number of assistants. Okay. Yeah, um, both the circuit uh, circuit clerk. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, the clerk. And also the uh, the prosecutor and attorney's office, all the funding comes from the county. A so. couple right. of comments uh, in regards to the question you asked me, Bill. Damon Wright said uh, possibly bringing charges against law enforcement for breaking the law, such as excessive force during an arrest, as to why a prosecuting attorney might not be popular with the police department. Uh, Alonzo Perry, I've heard cases where officers criticize prosecutors for allowing them to be badgered on the stand or fail to act on evidence charges they have filed against someone. And uh, also, listening to the interviews today, uh, Joe Kinzer, <clears throat> who texted me and said, Rob, can you clarify that Katie can't and doesn't endorse me as a judicial candidate? And from Katie uh, herself, I need to be clear on two points. I cannot endorse any candidate. It's prohibited by the rules. And two, we present incarcerated bound overs in the first term because incarcerated cases take priority. The remaining bound over cases that are bound over for more than a term are generally not incarcerated because they would be entitled to a PR bond. So that from uh, yeah. two people in the prosecuting attorney's office, one of whom, of course, is the prosecuting attorney. So we are talking to Jason Stedman, who has declared as a candidate for the prosecuting attorney position, which is open as a result of Katie Wilkes delegating the current prosecuting attorney uh, running for judge in this uh, next upcoming election. Yeah, in the judicial races, there are uh, the candidates are prohibited of saying what their position on a certain issue would be. Mm -hmm. Does that same prohibition apply for prosecuting attorney? I, d I don't believe so, that the yeah. rules are different for the judicial nominations. Yeah. Jason, this position has been described in past by those who run for it as an, more of an administrative management uh, type position. Can you give us an example of some situations you've encountered where your management skills in the past uh, would be beneficial? Well, I've run businesses, as you know, and I've run organizations, and I think that is going to be pivotal. Um, we're going to need to train additional people coming up and make sure that the right people are in the right positions. I think that managerial experience will be important, and that's why my 25 years of legal experience are going to be very important, um, running different businesses and different organizations. How about handling budgets and such? Um, well, as you know, dealing with the the boys back to the Boy Scouts, we deal with a large budget every year, and we have to make sure those monies are raised and those monies are, are brought in to make sure we handle our budget. Running a local business, I also dealt with the budget on a daily basis, making sure that we could make payroll and, and do the things you have to do as a business going forward. Would you view yourself as a person who would take a lot of cases as a prosecuting attorney or delegate to the appropriate uh, attorneys under you? I would delegate the appropriate attorneys under me, but if a case required my attention, I would definitely keep it and, and do my part. Have you handled high-profile uh, 
criminal cases in the past, murder, for instance, uh, cases like that? Have you prosecuted anything like that? Uh, yes, I have. I've, I've prosecuted more cases than I can tell you. Um, I've done very high profile cases actually when um, I was getting started. And even as an intern, I was involved in the Terry Shivo case in Pinellas County. Oh, that's interesting. Tell, tell me more about that case that had national headlines for the longest time. Um, that was the case in Pinellas County where it was somebody that wasn't treated for religious reasons and then was basically brought into the hospital at the last minute. Um, and the, the church was actually involved in being accused for not getting her the appropriate medical care. Um, I was actually in the sheriff's office when her body came in um, to the medical examiner's office. That's fascinating. That uh, dominated headlines for I don't know how long that was, yeah. but it seemed like that's all you heard about before the long. Was that about 25 years ago? Yeah, for a while there, Pinellas County was in the news a lot with that and Hanging Chad. So Hanging Chad. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. My, my cousin named her son Chad during that election. There was kind of a little funny joke she played on the rest yeah. of the world. So is this position, is this a nonpartisan race? Or no, I'm a Republican you're, candidate. Okay, you're a Republican candidate. Okay. And... Um, Kinzer is is he a Republican as well? Or? We are. We're both, Republicans. both Republicans. Okay. So, and we haven't heard of a Democratic candidate for this race yet, have we? I have not. Okay. And unlike the judges, this race will have the primary along with all the other candidates, and have it. You'll be again on the general in November. Correct. correct. So, uh, whereas the the judges, everything is done in May. Right. Correct. Jason, how do you balance the egos of attorneys who want to take on the the cases that they want to take on that you don't? maybe think they might be best for? Well, you need to look at what kind of individuals are gonna be handling which types of cases. And if you can set things into specialization where certain individuals specialize on certain kind of cases, I think that's probably the best way to handle it. How many attorneys, prosecuting attorneys are in the prosecuting attorney's office, do you know? I, th I think about 10 right now. It's about 10? Yeah. What, what kind of turnover do they have? Have you been able to look into that at all? they are short and they have been short. I know that there are, I think about three attorneys down right now. Um, the individuals that are there tend to be staying and I, I think that's a good thing. Um, but the, some of the new attorneys have left and, and they need to be refilled. Are we graduating as many attorneys as we used to out of the law schools in West Virginia and elsewhere? I think that we are. However, the bar passage rate was down very noticeably this year we think as a result of covid mm -hmm. because the students weren't in seats and weren't in class so we did notice a big drop in the bar passage rate was that typical of all the law schools through the I, country i don't know about across the country yeah. but i knew that that result has happened yeah. in west virginia are any of the cuts affecting the west virginia university school of law not that i know of uh, Mark, not, not, I, I look through I, the list. I don't think there's any. In, uh, oh, I think there is. And don't ask me which ones. But in our morning breakfast, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Carl and Horace Shengel both alluded the fact they are suffering some cuts. Really? They are. Okay. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. Uh, also, Katie said the legislature has no involvement in the amount of the county prosecuting attorney's budget. Yeah, I, I didn't think we did. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I'd still work with the county commission right. and the county council uh, to make sure that we get the appropriate amounts. Very good. Hey, hey, we've got about a minute left. Go ahead, Bill. You I was going to say, it's uh, the uh, the judicial side, the judges, uh, magistrates, and circuit are all under the in, under the control of the Supreme Court, whereas the circuit clerk and the prosecuting office are under the financial support of the county commission but they're standalone independent entities which are elected officials good clarification now, does the court you. generate any funds for the the county um through through court fees or anything like that is there anything that's revenue generating not for the, the county not that goes back to the prosecuting attorney or the circuit clerk no okay. jason final word is yours well, I just look forward to the election. I look forward to any community support out there. Um, I believe I'm the right person for the job. I've got the right experience and I've got the right temperament. Um, I look forward to meeting a lot of the voters out on the campaign trail, and I look forward to the primary election in May. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Jason. Jason.